intriguing. Always compelling. Profiles of the greatest names of the past and present. It's an all-new season of the Ace Award-winning South Bank Show, coming up next, only on Bravo. Tootsie, out of Africa, and now The Firm. Sidney Pollock, a Hollywood master filmmaker. Adapting a bestseller is always ticklish. I think with this film, it's interesting, this is one of the few situations I can remember where changes were made to the book, and I think the changes were for the better. Well, I'm currently doing an externship for two extra credits as a clerk with Judge Hookstratton. B.J. Hookstratton. Well, that's more impressive than being in the top 5%. The thing about the firm is that <laughs> Sidney took a big movie and tried to make it the way one makes a not-so-big movie the way one made these mid-range movies. The first year associate is only 2,000 hours, not the usual 25 or 26 or 2700. We want you to have a life outside the office. Don't you? When you look at the movie and you see it's the pauses and the moments that make the scenes. So it has a very specific emotional rhythm. Tired of interviews? No, sir. I just don't quite know what to say. Unusual for a lawyer. Oh, I can get tongue-tied in any number of situations, sir, but it's usually with my wife. You have that kind of constant tension that what's going to happen and what, what, what... Is there something else underlying there? It's fun. Do you have a, an offer in mind? It includes a bonus schedule, a low-interest mortgage so you can buy a home, country club membership, and we'll lease you a new Mercedes. You pick the color, Mitch. Lamar! He hasn't been paying attention. His wife picks the color. Hello, welcome to the new South Bank show season. This weekend, Sidney Pollock's new thriller, The Firm, opened in Britain, having been at number one in the American box office for three successive weeks, longer as it happens than Jurassic Park over there. Starring Tom Cruise and Gene Hackman, it's based on John Grisham's bestseller, and it tells the story of Mitch McDear, a young Harvard Law School graduate who joins a Memphis law firm only to discover deep-seated corruption and mafia control. It also contains many of the qualities that have made Sidney Pollock one of the most successful craftsman directors in Hollywood. Great narrative flair, ease with performances, and above all, energy. Parking brake. Parking brake release. Anti-skid. Anti-skid is on. Four lights are out. Brakes, Check. Steering and flight controls. Brakes and steering are good. Flight controls are free and clear. Flight instruments. Flight instruments are set for takeoff. For takeoff checklist, this one's good. Okay, good. Then it's going to hold each other in right now. You're up. You're up. His previous films over a 25-year stint include They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Three Days of the Condor, Tootsie, and Out of Africa. All of them demonstrating his ability to draw out memorable performances from some of Hollywood's leading stars. I talked to him at his bungalow on the Universal lot in Los Angeles about his career in films and the difficulties of turning a bestseller into a successful movie. Do you think one of the reasons it seems to have hit such a nerve with the American public as we're sitting here now, it's been open for three weeks as we're talking and it's taken something like 85 million. 96. 96. I, mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be yeah, a yeah, stickler yeah, for details. Well, no, right. you, you bring it up there. No, do you think, this, this do you think one of the reasons, I mean, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is a, a general disenchantment with the law in this country, that, that people now feel that it is full of lawyers law-breaking with tax evasion and corruptions of various sorts, and this is a big, big example of it. Yes, exactly. I mean, I do think that people identify with this guy who thinks he's got the American dream, hmm. ribbon-wrapped and shining. It's like, it's too good to be true. This idea of something that 
perfect being handed to him, and then it turns out to be absolutely rotten. I don't know. There's something that people understand and identify with about that. <laughs> Plus the fact that in this case, there's, I'm sure, a lot of resentment and anger about the disillusionment of, of this sense that we came out of the 80s with, that the, that the lawmakers were as corrupt as the lawbreakers and that you couldn't trust anybody and that finally what you had to trust was yourself. It goes back to, the, to a lot of the cowboy films, though, doesn't it? Because the good cowboy comes into the very nice American town, which looks on the outside, this is the good pioneering town, but inside that town is corrupted by a, a drunk lawman, a, the big ranchers outside have got the town in, its, in, in their grip and he cleans it out. So there's, there's a direct relationship with those films, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean I mean, I think that uh, the tradition in American films has been this particular character who got off his horse and put on a trench coat and a fedora and became a private eye, you know, later in the 40s, and then he went on and became, you know, the guy who was... It's always the individual that's against these bureaucracies that's been a kind of mainstay in, in American filmmaking, and it's, it's part of... It's part of what fascinates Americans, in a way. It always has. And now uh, he's a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and we know what Shakespeare had to say about lawyers. You think I'm talking about breaking the law? No, I'm just trying to figure out how far you want to invent. As far as you can without breaking it. In other words, don't risk an IRS audit. I don't give a damn about an audit. They just better not win. This uh, film came from the book, uh, The Firm, by John Grisham, which sold something like seven million copies and is 500 pages long, and you've made a two-and-a-half-hour film. I can see the attraction of that. The book's already done well, so there's a proven, very well, <laughs> so there's a proven audience, but there's also obvious drawbacks. So what problems did you face? Well, I, there were enormous problems for me. I mean, I really, I really did not want to do this uh, for a long time, and the more the book sold, the more I was uh, frightened of trying to do it. Uh, number one, just, just the first thing that you said, the compression of it was daunting because it's a complex story to tell. There are a lot of characters in it, a lot. And they all are are essential in one way or another to the kind of fabric of this piece. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? Well, we've been informed there's somebody smarter. You didn't get the highest score in the bar exam. You got the second highest score. <laughs> I started with the ending. The ending of the book is very, very different. Once we started to change the end of the book, then as you know, you can't just change the ending. It, it starts way early to make that change happen. So we, we did radical changes from the middle on. Um, there is an infidelity for example, in the book, which is never confessed in the book. We chose to have him confess this infidelity because that created an estrangement. And that estrangement created the opportunity for some version of a love story which I frankly get bored if I'm directing a movie and there's no love story in it. I just, I just get bored. And uh, so I, I knew I was going to have trouble finding a love story within this because it didn't exist in the book. That night, that night in the Caymans when you telephoned. You were on the beach. What did you do? No. You didn't. Trying to get his wife back was the love story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, some form of, of a courtship and a love story there and a, and a kind of redemption, if you will, a kind of redeeming of himself because he had, he had betrayed... You also made a strong woman and you've... you've 
again and again gone for strong women in your films. And she, in the book, is not passive, but she's nothing like as strong as she's in the film. That's right. I mean, in the book, she's very supportive of him, but she's not front and center in the plot. Mm. Nor is she, I would necessarily say, wiser than he, which I like and wanted to do. I mean, in this case, I tried to play more heavily on the clues that the book had, which is that she was born wealthy uh, and knew that it wasn't an answer to anything. He, he's a man, uh, this sounds a little pretentious, but, but it's just the underpinnings for us, but he's a man who's trying to fix something that he feels as a lack inside with something that he can acquire on the outside. He's, he's trying to cover a hole that he feels characterologically inside with, with accoutrements that he can buy, with the, you know, the symptoms of wealth, so to speak. And she's wiser than that and knows that that's not going to fix it. You don't even know what moves me about you, do you? Mitch, I know what you want, but it's not for me. It's not even for you, and you know it. It's easy for somebody rich to talk about being poor like it's some fly that's bothering you, just wave it away. This isn't about rich or poor. This is about trying to fix something that won't get fixed with ten Mercedes. Hey, th that's not fair, Abby. That's not fair. This is about a mother in a trailer park and a brother you pretend you don't have. I read the book, and I liked the book. I read it quickly, and I liked it. But I was petrified that the logic of it wouldn't hold up on screen. And I have writers sometimes refer to me as the logic Nazi. And, uh, and I do do that. I do sort of worry to death the logic of these things. Because I'm petrified that the vividness of seeing a thriller on the screen it exposes holes like crazy that don't get exposed when you're reading. He has a, a, a superb intuition about what communicates itself well in a scene and what doesn't. And, and uh, if you're not getting the major dramatic point with sufficient clarity, uh, if you haven't written it with sufficient clarity, he, even if he won't be able to tell you why, he will let you, he'll let you know it's wrong. And, and eventually he'll be able to tell you why, but it's, he's, it, it's almost as if uh, at that point he's like an actor who uh, says, I can't say the lines right, there's something wrong. I mean, that's, it's that sharp an intuition, and you really got to listen to him. I'm afraid that if you saw him go in every day and saw how corrupt the firm was, the way you know it in the book, you would sit there and say, why is he going to work? You would see it so clearly. So I was trying to gradually pull every support from under him, every possible way to turn, so that when somebody says, so that he says, why, why don't I just leave? The FBI guy says, well, that's what the Kaczynski and Hodge were trying to do. You can't just leave. So he says, now, wait a minute. You, you want me to testify against my friends, testify against the mafia, spy on these guys, but are you out of your mind? Forget it. And then the guy says, well, wait a second. How long do you think it's going to take for them to put X and Y together with your brother? So there's another layer of force on him. That part wasn't in the book because I felt it was absolutely essential to, to just nail him against the wall in order to believe that he was going to do this. How long before they find out Lomax's cellmate was a guy named Ray McDear? And when they do, what do you think they'll do to him? They can get to anyone, anywhere. What can you do? Your brother comes up for parole soon, doesn't he? You cooperate with us, I'll guarantee the board will be grateful. Otherwise, well, you know what those parole hearings are like. Could go either way. Grisham didn't know anything about what we were doing. He never asked to read the script. I would have given it to him, but he never asked for it. He came on the set a couple of times with his, with his kids and his wife, and as he was new to this, I kept warning him and saying, John, you know, you're probably not going to like a lot of this because it's different. Uh, the end is different. The characters are a bit different. I didn't go into, you know, 
too much detail, but the first time he saw it was at the premiere in New York, and I really was petrified that he was going to hate it because it was radically different. Uh, but he was wonderful about it. He came out and said he was crazy about it. As a matter of fact, he picked one spot, that little speech that I just said about how long is it going to take before they put your brother together with this cop, Eddie Lomax, and he said, I should have thought of that. <laughs> he was very <laughs> sweet about it. He said that he sat there, it's been a long time since he wrote the book, and said to Renee, his wife, every thing would come on, he'd look over and say, was that in the book? <laughs> <laughs> and she'd say, no, that wasn't in the book. <laughs> had a couple of problems with this scene. Number one, it doesn't exist as we're doing it here in the book. Since we wanted to change that ending and finish it in Memphis, we tried to devise some climactic uh, equivalent of the gunfight or the shootout, which is pretty standard in a, in a picture with this form. We didn't have a lot to use, but when I was there in some of the earliest location scouts, one of the most interesting things was this tram that goes over to Mud Island. Uh, there's a new mini cam that's uh, a little tiny small IMO with a counterweight at the bottom of it. You just sort of aim it and run with it. It's, it's not a steady cam, it's much lighter. So we use that for some of these running shots up and down the stairs. Here we use the back of a little uh, dirt bike motorcycle uh, for these runs and drove the motorcycle across. This was a helicopter then and the idea was to slowly see him gaining, 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 gaining and to keep there some kind of nice rhythm that I thought we would get of seeing a little bit of the action then very still, Tom thinking, then running, 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 then very still. Tom thinking, then more running, 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 then very still Tom thinking, and each time what you're seeing is that um, it's sort of landing on him in a way. There are no special effects here, and we don't even have any high-tech devices. It's just a guy on foot running. But on some simple level, it works in this case if you're sufficiently invested in him emotionally. Plus, Cruz really runs. I don't know why he's got those legs, boy. He just pumps and pumps like a rabbit. I think Sidney Pollack is really the best of old-style, mainstream, classic Hollywood directing. Pollock has been at it for years and years and years. He's gotten better. I mean, directing really is a craft. It's not a hobby, you know. It's not something for one-time sensations. It's a craft. The great directors made dozens of films. John Ford made 50 or 60 films. If you're good, you get better, and he's been getting better. I mean, you started out as an adult, as a, an actor, and then as a teacher of acting, and then as a, a, a dialogue coach to Burt Lancaster. So you, <laughs> before you even started directing, you, you'd done a lot of that. Uh, that must be a help. I mean, I think people would be fascinated to know, what do you actually say to them? Do you say, I know you've read the part, how do you want to play it? This is how I want to play it? Or do you say, I'm glad you haven't read the part because I want to read it with you? Or what, 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 you, what happens? Uh, well, the, the background that I had has been very, very useful to me. It's not essential, as you know. There are many, many, many great directors who don't have that kind of a background, and it isn't an essential thing, but it's a great, great tool in working with actors. Uh, the thing, I don't... I always do it, everything differently. I mean, it depends on the, on the actor. I mean, I would work differently with Cruz than I do with Hackman, completely differently, because their level of experience is different, the way they attack parts is different, uh, who they are is so different. Uh, in every case, the goal is the same, which is really to create some sort of an environment in which these people will be able to find the most truthful responses they can to this material that they can they can create the sense of a, of a life within these imaginary circumstances that you're gonna believe what led you to law school I can't remember sure you can counselor 
I was a delivery boy for a pizza parlor, and one day the owner got a notice from the IRS. He was an immigrant, didn't know much English, even less about withholding tax, and he went bankrupt, lost his store. It was the first time I thought of being a lawyer. In other words, you're an idealist. I don't know any tax lawyer who's an idealist. When he lost his store, I lost my job. That scared me. Being out of work? No. What the government can do to anybody. You really don't want to feel that the actors know there's a camera on them. And, and so the more you can get them to be private about it, to almost the feeling that you're, you're intruding on something that's happening by itself, is, is what you keep trying to do always. And every time I'm watching a scene, I keep thinking, what's wrong with this picture? Why does this look like a movie? What can, how can this movie scene not be a movie scene? You know, what would make it not a movie scene? What would make it um, feel like we're spying on it, like we're like it's more private, let's say that we're because there's this sense of privilege that audiences feel in movies that they really are peeking through a keyhole. It's a, it's a whole other, it's a whole other experience. What about you? What led you to law school? <laughs> so far back, I don't think I can remember. Sure, you can, counselor. I used to caddy for young lawyers off from work on weekdays and their wives. I'd look at those long tan legs and just knew I had to be a lawyer. The wives had long tan legs, too. Alice, another martini, please. Almost the logic of that would be that you shoot it once, but I guess you have several takes. So on take seven, for technical reasons, you take again. Or on take 17, because somebody isn't on form that morning. Mm -hmm. What happens then? How do you do, well, do it then? If you've got a script that works and you use the right judgment casting the actor, an awful lot of your work is done. <clears throat> and I don't do a lot of rehearsal on film because, because I really do believe that performances begin to question themselves as they go on. And then you would need the same amount of time you have in a theater performance, four or five weeks, to get it back up to the original spontaneity, which it loses the minute it begins to question itself. Sometimes you have to do take after take after take after take, and there you really try to keep it fresh in some way. You try to get them to change something, make something different in a way, so that each time it has the feeling of for the first time, even if you say to the actor, try to do it for the first time now, even if you're literally saying that to them. The actor you've worked with most consistently has been Robert Redford uh, in some of his best performances. You came across uh, Redford very early in your career, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And very early in his career. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is always a pleasant coincidence, isn't it? And did you see things then that you thought, ah, this guy can do that sort of thing and I like him for that? Yes, I did. I, I, and what I, was that sort of thing that he could do? I saw in, you know, very early on what I thought was the sense of, of terrific intelligence, <clears throat> the sense of withholding in a certain way that I liked, um, kind of prototypically American character. And as such, he's been the perfect kind of alter ego or whatever for me to tell these particular kind of love stories, which I like to tell, which, which I think are just very, very American, no matter whether I'm doing them in, you know, in Africa or somewhere else. There's something American to me in the nature of, of that particular character. Well, I think that, that we're, we're alike in certain ways and we're very opposite in certain ways. And I think the chemical balance of what we're, how we're alike and how we're opposite is probably what has been the chief part of our endurance as friends. I actually met him as an actor, I was an actor too. We actually acted in a movie in 1960. It was his first movie ever, and it was the, I think the only movie I ever did until I played a part in Tootsie later on, years and years later. Uh, 
And we were the only two people on the set, as I remember, who didn't say anything. And so we were sort of curious about each other. He was as quiet as I was on the set. I don't know whether he was as scared as I was, but he was as quiet as I was. The, the first film we did together as actors, he, he played my commanding officer. And I, I don't think he ever got the idea out of his head. I think he still has it in his head. And I, you know, I go along with that. Because I know him so well personally, I know, I know the areas that are uncomfortable for him. I know, for the most part, how he feels about a lot of things. Would have been a lot of, a lot of drunk nights, staying up talking until two and three, four in the morning, um, about everything. And that's a help. Knowing somebody that well is just a big help. Well, the thing that really made it work and has always made Sydney's work, I think. Um, special is the intelligence behind it. I mean, everything was thought out as to what made sense from both a story standpoint, character standpoint, and just straight dramatic standpoint. And so that intellect about making something work through intelligence was something that connected us. Probably the, the greatest thing that I've learned from Sydney is the attention to detail. This is a major. This is Joe Turner. Listen, identification? What? Identification. Uh, my name is Turner. I work for you. Now listen. Identify yourself. Uh, well, I don't... What is your designation? Uh, Condor. Section 9, Department 17. The section's been hit. What level? What level? Level of damage. Everybody. Dr. Lapp, Janice, Ray, Harold. Harold was in the... Uh, uh... Are you in a company line? No, no, I'm in a phone booth. I'm, I'm just a block away. I'm in the street. You're in violation of secure communication procedures, Condor. Listen, you son of a bitch. I'm telling you, I came back with lunch and it was raining and the whole house was murdered. Everybody is dead. You mentioned that you acted with him in 60. The next time you acted in the film was in Tootsie, uh, where you play the agent to with a character played by Dustin Hoffman to Tootsie. Why did you return to acting then in that particular film? Because Dustin drove me crazy, because Dustin insisted that I be the agent to the point where I was ready to go insane. I truly didn't, didn't believe him. I thought he was joking, and I did not want to play that part. He actually began to send me flowers saying, please be my agent, love Dorothy, you know, as courting me to be the agent. Dustin is a, you know, a remarkably gifted actor, as you know, but he had, he's a very method kind of actor. And his point was uh, that in Some Like It Hot, there were machine guns that made those guys put on the dress. There were no machine guns in Tootsie. The thing that made him put on the dress was his agent says, you're never going to work again. Dustin kept saying to me, if a peer of mine, another actor, says you're never going to work again, I'm not going to put on the dress. If you say to me, you're not going to work again, maybe I'll put on the dress. And I said, Dustin, that's ridiculous. You're an actor. Come on. Are you saying that nobody in New York will work with me? Oh, no, that's too limiting. Nobody in Hollywood wants to work with you either. I can't even send you up for a commercial. You play the tomato for 30 seconds, they want a half a day over schedule because you wouldn't sit down. Yes, it wasn't logical. You were a tomato! A tomato doesn't have logic. A tomato can't move. That's what I said. So if he can't move, how's he going to sit down, George? I was a stand-up tomato, a juicy, sexy beefsteak tomato. Nobody does vegetables like me. I did an evening of vegetables off Broadway. I did the best tomato, the best Look, cucumber. I, I did wanna... an on-deep salad that knocked the critics on their ass. Michael, I, I'm trying to stay calm here. You uh, are a wonderful actor. Thank you. But you're too much trouble. Get some therapy. Okay, thanks. I'm going to raise $8,000, and I'm going to do Jeff's play. Michael, you're not going to raise 25 cents. No one will hire you. Oh, yeah? Because of what happened in that scene, there were persistent reports that you and he had rowed in the making of that film, which you have persistently denied. <laughs> Well, no, I don't deny that we didn't argue it. I think that people misunderstand that. People probably think we argued all the time, which we didn't do. And people probably think we argued about directing and acting, which we never, ever, ever, ever did. What arguments we had really had to do more with a tone problem. <clears throat> he and I disagreed on two things, and we disagreed vehemently on both of them. 
One is how much the world cares about the life of an actor. And the other is how bawdy should this humor be. Because it's a man in a dress, I felt there were real traps into where this could go, where you could get into real bathroom humor. And uh, I think, you know, Dustin felt that a more bawdy approach was what he wanted to do. I was much more interested in other things in that picture. I mean, Such I was, as? Well, I was more interested in this, what I felt was the theme of the piece, which was that this is the story of a man who, in a way, becomes a better man for having been a woman. And I, I wanted to, to be as comic and as crazy as possible, but I wanted very much for it to add up to some sort of metaphorical lesson Astrology is so stupid. I told you. Stupid about times. it. Yeah, it is. I'm so sick of listening to your crap about soybeans and Zen foods and zodiac. Leave Go on, me get alone. in the car. Not... Hey, Look, get in the car. Who do you think you're talking to? Hey, listen to me. You want to embarrass me in front of my friends? They're trying to make an intellectual conversation. You're sitting here jerking off about the to tofu and crystals or something. Well, believe me, then that 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 just stupid. There's nothing intellectual get about it. In the car, them. will you? No, Come on. Go Come on. on. Yes, you to... are. No! Get... Shut up. Ah! Shut your mouth, will you? What you crazy? You think want to embarrass you? Get, you want to embarrass me? Are you coming with me or not? No, oh, I hate you, you stupid... Friends! Get in the car. Get your ass in the car Where's right my now. Bag? Get in the car. I don't know where it is. It doesn't matter where it is. Here, get in the car. God damn, I must have been out of my mind. Crazy. Totally crazy. Get too drunk to die. Oh, I'm not drunk. drunk. Just shut up. Let's go. My shit. Look what you've done now! Just, ah! Just to, to continue with the acting for, for a minute or two, you, you were in um, the player, but can we talk a little bit about Husbands and Wives, where you have sure. a substantial part there, really? I mean, one of the, if there are four lead parts, you're one of the four lead parts. What, why, did you, why did you want to do that, and what did you enjoy about doing it? Um, well, I, didn't, I don't really like acting that much at all, but I'm a big Woody Allen fan, and, uh, and when I got this call from Juliet Taylor, his casting, uh, the person who casts with him, um, I, I couldn't say no. I said, well, I'll, let me read the script. And, and when he sent, once he sent the script, I was crazy about the script. I thought it was a smart, beautifully observed, uh, really well uh, thought out and defined and true, painfully true kind of observation on the nature of those kinds of relationships. I hated the guy I played. I mean, I thought he was a real jerk. And, you know, actors always want to play heroic parts, you know. I didn't want to play this jerk. Who are you? Who are you? Jack! My God! You changed the lock on my own what goddamn house. Here? Who's this? Who's this? This is, this is my husband. It's none of your business. Please, none of my leave business. right now. I don't want to leave. Uh, leave right now. Right. Am I all right? All right what the hell are you? Who are you? Hey, is he living here? Don't What's get the upset. deal? Don't get upset. Don't get What's upset. he doing? Me in our bed? Hey, hey, let's no, Don't get, let's hey, not Michael, get ugly. Michael, my Michael, house. Michael, let's not get ugly. It's my Michael, house. No, I can talk to him, really. Please, go upstairs. Please. Where's he going Michael. now? Up there. Yes, Where's if I know, I, if I'm sure. in going up to I our be, bed? Is that the deal? It's not our bed, Jack, anymore. No, now, listen, you need some black coffee. I'm going to make it then just, you know, go. Sally, listen, I want to come back. Oh, Oh, please. Oh, man, my life is such a mess. I found the whole experience absolutely fascinating. He says very, very little. Um, he does most of the work in the writing and in the casting. Going back to, again, what I said about casting. I hate saying that, particularly about the fact that I played such a jerk, because I keep wondering what he knows <laughs> to have discovered this truth in me um, and I was depressed about it for weeks but but I went ahead and did it and that's it that's in my acting career you gonna continue with it probably not I mean if somebody asks and it's fun if it's a part that's fun um, 
Yeah, but they don't. I mean, it, I don't know. There was that rush for, for that little moment, and I've got to get on with some directing now. <laughs> Sidney Pollock achieved his first major critical success as a director in 1969 with They Shoot Horses, Don't They? A powerful look at the dance marathon phenomenon during the Depression era. It's a very cruel portrait of American society at that time. And the cruelty is emphasized by the way you shoot it. In the film, every so often, tired as they are, they have to run around the ballroom in couples, and the last two or three get there out of the competition. Now, you did push that very hard. And so wh what were you doing there? Probably being young. <laughs> I mean, I don't know that I'd push it that hard if I had it to do over again. Um, I, I got a hold of something like a bit that gets in your mouth, uh, and it was the, the theatricality of it, and it was the thing I held on to. And, but that was the truth of what the story was, really. I mean, that's to get that film to its ultimate conclusion, which was to get a woman in a perfectly reasonable way to say to somebody, would you please blow my brains out, and for him to say, oh, sure, where would you like me to do it and when? And for you to believe it, again, was what I was worried about and, and felt that I had to take it to such an extreme to get you to accept this horrible thing in such a matter-of-fact way. No. To your own uh, deeper background, you said that what you mostly remember about the small town in which you were brought up was the train ride out of it to New York. Um, and there's a great deal of flight and moving away and moving across boundaries in your movies, whether it's Jeremiah Johnson or it's Out of Africa or it's uh, Havana. There's a the movement away in flight, and we know about your own interest in literally in flying aeroplanes and so on. Um, do you think the idea of going away uh, and traveling towards something better is something that has informed your movies? Yes, very much so. I mean, I think there is a romance to travel, which certainly I have. I mean, I, I am, uh, have that disease. Um, the, uh, there is a promise in travel, always. Uh, it's usually it's unfulfilled, but there's a promise of of newness, of growth, of change that's uh, hard to resist. And I think that uh, a lot of the spirit or the character of this country was, you know, in a way founded on this sense of leaving somewhere else and beginning all over again from scratch something new. And that's, that's, there's an irresistible appeal in that. A certain, it's kind of primal appeal, I think, in people.
jet like this, it's one of the few things that you can do and not and not think about anything else. It's, there's something very relaxing about it. You use both sides of your brain. I mean, there's a part of it that's sensory, the seat of your pants part, and then there's the, the sort of technical challenge, which comes from this part. So the, the combination of the two is very satisfying. This particular airplane is a difficult plane to fly because it's slippery, it's extremely streamlined. See, as I was talking to you right here, I realize I'm coming up on a spot. I could, I could fly over it in a second, so I'm gonna have to go down fairly quickly now to make the speeds. It's a very, very streamlined airplane. It requires a kind of a light touch on it. You have to stay very alert and very sharp. What attracted you to out of Africa? Uh, I thought that the courage of that woman was was extraordinary. Her ability to take, if you will, every tragedy that happened to her and turn it into wisdom in a certain way, which is what she did. Um, Plus, of course, the love story in it, which is uh, I'm a sucker for, and and the fact that in a sense it was the same two characters that I feel are are the characters I'm most sympathetic to. What's wrong with marriage, anyway? Have you ever seen one you admire? Yes, I have many. Belfields, for one. Yeah, he sent her home for the rains in 1910. Didn't tell her they were over till 1913. It's not a joke. People marry. It's not revolutionary. There's some animals that mate for life. Geese. <laughs> and they're characters that I, I feel like I know because they've been in my in the movies that I've made. Not that literally, but the concept of a, of a man, who learns from a, a strong woman, a strong wise woman, but doesn't learn enough and isn't finally able to overcome the last hurdle that it would take for them to to be together is 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 a kind of a basic storytelling element that I've been drawn to. He wants to live a life in which he doesn't have to give up any of himself in order to be connected. I don't know whether that's possible or not, but I know it's, inter it's interesting to explore it. That argument is an interesting argument. Karen, I'm with you because I choose to be with you. I don't want to live someone else's idea of how to live. Don't ask me to do that. I don't want to find out one day that I'm at the end of someone else's life. I'm willing to pay for mine, to be lonely sometimes, to die alone if I have to. I think that's fair. Not quite. You want me to pay for it as well? No, you have a choice. And you're not willing to do the same for me. I won't be closer to you. And I won't love you more because of a piece of paper. The film was so successful with the Academy, it won so many Oscars because it's classic filmmaking. It's what the Academy likes to see. It's the vision they have of themselves of this kind of big, grand, well-acted, well-made films. And that's what they're looking for. That's what they got with him. And it didn't matter that the critics didn't like it. It didn't even matter how popular it was with the audience. It's the kind of filmmaking that the Academy was created to accept and to, and to praise. You suffered the opposite with Havana. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things you said, which interested me intensely, was it, A, you made it just like you made Tootsie and all your other films. You went in exactly. thinking exactly the same. You didn't reach out in any different way or say, I've got a head on my hands to start with, and I've got such a big budget, I'll be able to do it very well, and Redford's in full. You just went and did it the same. And B, you're astonished at the reaction 
which was let's for the sake of this uh, uh, say it was a very bad reaction right across the board that's right and C if you made it again you'd make it in exactly the same way that's right that's right it's I, I think that people think that you have control over what's successful or not. That's absurd. Of course, these I don't tell anybody that because I'll, my stock will go down here immediately. And studios, of course, believe that you, if you are you are a hit maker or you are not a hit maker. I mean, that's never mind the serious part of filmmaking. The necessary part of filmmaking is that you pay back money and then some. Otherwise, you don't get an opportunity to make any more films. I didn't do anything different on the flops than I did on the success. As a matter of fact, in many cases, I thought the material was better. Get past us, you It's all over! It's over! I make a movie that I want to see. And sometimes I'm absolutely amazed that that many people agree with me. And sometimes I'm absolutely amazed that nobody agrees with me. This is hard, this kind of, uh, you're risking the whole store every time you open it, the kind of situation where pictures are costing 40 and 50 million dollars. And if they're not returning 200 or 300 million dollars, it's their flops. This is kind of silly. It's odd you should say that because recently in London, when he came over to see the musical Sunset Boulevard, Billy Wilder said precisely the same thing. You're kidding. He said that he uh, couldn't conceive of making films in Hollywood now because the pressure on him, on one film director, to carry the whole studio would be too much. He just couldn't have taken it on board. Yeah, so yeah it's that's exactly right. Yeah. And that's, and don't, you know, that is a very real feeling today where you feel that you have the whole studio riding on your back when you go out to work now. Instead of being, there is something wonderful about the anonymity, in a way, of being part of a whole group of films that are coming out so that if your film is good, it kind of rises to the surface by itself. And if it's not good, the whole world doesn't go like this. And, it's, and it's, it's not so visible. It's gotten terribly scientific now. I mean, you get, you know, you are told before a picture opens whether it's going to be successful. You are told that it's going to open. Guys come to you with, with things that say, well, we've got a 75% unaided awareness. That means we're a hit. Well, what do you mean it means we're a hit? Well, it means people will show up on the first day. Okay. And we've got a 26% first one to see compared with seven other films. So there's just no, you, don't, you know pretty much how many people are going to come the first day. And those figures are quite accurate, are they? They're more accurate than not, unfortunately. But if the audience doesn't like the film, it doesn't matter what you do. They just won't go. They won't go. What amuses me is Hollywood's becoming like your movies. <laughs> There's the lone individual in the firm or in Three Days with a Condor yeah. or in Jeremiah Johnson or in Absence of Manners, huh. which we haven't talked about, which I right. thought was... And there they are, and they take on these institutions which are more and more uh, crushing them down. <laughs> And with a bit of optimism on the part of the filmmaker, <laughs> they, well, the they sail is, off in a boat like Paul Newman does, or drive off in a battered old car like Tom Cruise does, or You are or whatever. always trying to sneak in your own personal view of the world, if you will, within this form of popular entertainment. That's what mainstream movie making is, is that you, you try to find a way to sugarcoat the pill, if you will, to, in the guise of, of, of pure popcorn entertainment, see if you can work relatively intelligently and make a film that is about something that concerns you without revealing that that's exactly what you're doing so that it looks like what you're doing is following the strict rules of the most entertaining form possible. And within that context, try to be reasonably intelligent. You heard me, Terrence. My brother out now. And make it a million and a half. How about you get down on your knees and kiss my ass for not indicting you as a co-conspirator right now, you chicken shit little Harvard? 
talking. I haven't done anything. And you know it. Who gives a f I'm a federal agent. You know what that means, you low life? You got no rights. Your life is mine. I could kick your teeth down your throat, yank them out your... I'm not even violating your civil rights. You are Agent Wayne Tarrant. Yeah, you're goddamn right I am. Maybe local cops can. Yeah. Is this Wayne Terrence? Who is this? Is this Wayne Terrence? Yeah, this is Wayne Terrence. So is this. I haven't done anything. And you know it. Who gives a f I'm a federal agent. You know what that means, you low life? Got no rights. Your life is mine. I could kick your teeth down your throat, yank them out your f I'm not even violating your civil rights. Yeah. I think you ought to reconsider.